Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. I'm trying to imagine what it must be like to design an Amazon warehouse. A typical Amazon fulfillment center is at least a million square feet, and it's filled with a zillion kilometers of shelving. And given that Amazon is all about speed, the company is always trying to cut down the time between when you click checkout and when the package shows up at your door. They're always looking for the most efficient ways to find whatever you ordered on those shelves and stuff it into a box. The logistics of this are mind-boggling. Not only do you have to categorize millions of items, but you have to group them in such a way that things that are in demand the most don't create choke points for all the robots that grab the stuff off the shelves. Music is a lot like an Amazon warehouse, except in some cases it's worse. Not only do we have to categorize everything to a very granular detail, but we also have to make it possible for us to fortuitously stumble over something that we might like. This is when we get into the whole idea of genres. At last count, Spotify had organized things to 2,424 different genres. There's also a website called Every Noise at Once that lists about 2,000 different genres. This is both terrifying and fascinating, and it deserves study. This is A Guide to Genres, Part 2. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Hi there, I'm Alan Cross, and this is the second half of a program designed to sort through the genre hierarchy of alt-rock, something that keeps getting more complicated by the day. On part one, we looked at everything from the evolution of rock and roll into just rock, and then the splintering that followed. That included the birth of punk in the mid-70s, and how it also splintered into a million different pieces. We also defined the difference between alt-rock, the favorite term in North America, and indie, which is what they use in the UK. That difference being not much. When we left off, I said we were going to sort through some of these sub 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 genres of alt rock. Now, obviously, we can't cover all 2,424 categories used by Spotify, but maybe we can at least hit some signposts, and we might as well do it in alphabetical order. First up on this this random list is art punk. This genre is rooted in the British art school tradition. These kinds of post-secondary institutions are reasonably common in North America and other parts of the world, but when it comes to music history, the art school thing has had its greatest effect in the UK. These became known as places to park kids who weren't going to make it in a British university. They were places for creative types who were into graphic design, the visual arts like painting and photography, theater, fine art, and so on. David Bowie, Roxy Music, The Talking Heads... They're all products of art school culture and ended up making what became known as art rock, some of which, as in the case of the Talking Heads, ended up being categorized as new wave. Art punk is like garage rock, raw, rugged, intense rock, but with a more sophisticated twist in terms of attitude and image. It's less working class, leaning more in the direction of educated cleverness, while sometimes incorporating elements of theater and performance art. Art punk bands include The Fall, Wire, XTC, Television, The Yeah Yeah Yeahs, Suicide, and Patti Smith. And you might also include Franz Ferdinand and Block Party. These guys are among my favorites of the genre. Art Brut. They're part British, part German, and took their name from a form of visual art made by outsiders like Prisoners and the Mentally Ill. This is from a 2005 album entitled Bang Band Rock and Roll. It's art punk from Art Brut in the form of a song called Form the Band. South London's Art Brute, with an example of a genre we call art punk. See what I mean about the cleverness? Next, we're going to look at baggy. This is what we in North America tend to refer to as Manchester, the kind of indie music that came out of that British city in the late 1980s and early 90s that eventually gave us some really fresh-sounding bands. Manchester had a music history reaching back to the 1960s with groups like the Hollies, Herman's Hermits, and the Bee Gees. But the modern chapter began in the middle 70s when the Sex Pistols brought punk to the city. That inspired the formation of a bunch of groups, including Joy Division, The Smiths, and The Fall. Along with the establishment of Factory Records by a local TV presenter named Tony Wilson, the music really took off on its own. 
The next part of the story starts with a clothing stall run by a guy named Phil Sachs. Sometime in the early 1980s, he received a shipment of bell-bottom trousers. Because these things were so outdated, he got them real cheap, so he could sell them at low, low, low prices. Some musical types bought his baggy pants as a way of rebelling against the trend of tight jeans. Customers included the Ryder Brothers, and Sachs soon started managing their band, which eventually became known as the Happy Mondays. By the late 80s, a new generation of groups, including the Happy Mondays, were mixing a loose sort of psych-inspired music with house and acid house dance music being spun by DJs in local clubs like the Hacienda, sometimes adding in a little funk, sometimes going in the direction of shimmering guitars. And there were drugs. Lots and lots of drugs, especially acid and ecstasy. By the end of the 80s, a holy trinity had emerged. To draw a historical analogy, the Happy Mondays were the Rolling Stones, the Stone Roses were the Beatles, and then there were the Inspiral Carpets, who could have been either the Kinks or the Who. The term baggy became interchangeable with Madchester, which is a word that can be credited to a guy named Philip Shotton, who worked as a video director for Factory Records. Around the same time, the British music press down in London started talking about the Manchester scene, and we're still talking about it today. So here's a sample of Baggy Manchester Manchester, The Stone Roses from 1989. The Stone Roses, music best heard while wearing baggy pants. It makes sense now to segue from baggy to Britpop. Now, Britpop was the major genre and scene and sound in the UK in the 1990s, and it could not have existed without baggy and Manchester. It is the direct descendant of that music. It took what Manchester was all about and added in some British musical nationalism, embracing the influences of the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks and the Who and the glam era and the mod era. Britpop emerged just as Manchester, Manchester, Baggy, whatever you want to call it, was fading. We had Blur and Suede and Elastica, Supergrass, Pulp, Menswear and dozens of others. And of course, the biggest of them all was Oasis. There's Oasis with a prime example of mid-90s Britpop. Moving to the letter C, here's another exclusively British genre that you may have wondered, what the hell is that? The name of this group of bands is C86. In May of 1986, the weekly British music magazine The Enemy included a special cassette with one of their issues. The tape featured a bunch of young bands who had recently been signed to a variety of independent British labels. If you know your cassette culture... You'll know that blank cassettes had special numerical designations. A C60 cassette had a capacity of 60 minutes. A C90 had 90 minutes worth of tape. And since it was 1986, the enemy chose to call its tape C86. All the artists on the tape sounded different, but they did have something in common. They were young, the music was raw and sometimes primitive, and nothing came from a major record label. Those acts who appeared on this tape eventually became known as C86 bands. And in time, C86 became shorthand for young, raw, primitive indie rock in the UK. Here's an example. The Mighty Lemon Drops were from Wolverhampton in the West Midlands. Their contribution to the cassette was called Happy Head. The Mighty Lemon Drops, a band originally lumped into a peculiarly British genre known as C86. Related genres are Britpop and certain branches of alt-rock, like the ones inhabited by R.E.M., Early Beck, The Breeders, and The Lemonheads. More genre discussions coming up. This is the second half of a dive into all the different genres we find in the world of alt-rock. We're obviously not going to go through all of them. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them but we're touching on a few in alphabetical order. Next up, we have Dream Pop. 
This is a very atmospheric and highly textured form of alt-rock that has DNA from both some corners of the goth universe mixed with that of certain characteristics of psychedelic music. As far as we can tell, the term dream pop was coined by a guy named Alex Aluli, who was part of an experimental British band from the mid-80s called A.R. Kane. The thing about dream pop is that you're supposed to immerse yourself in sound and get lost in the mood and the vibe. It's often, not always, but often, highly produced using a lot of guitars and synths loaded with effects. Or the desired mood and texture could be achieved with a special kind of minimalism. Here's an example of a subgenre of a subgenre. One final thing, a lot of dream pop features breathy vocals, which can either be male or female. For example, I picked this 2012 track from Lana Del Rey. It's an example of minimalist dream pop. A style of dream pop from Lana Del Rey Related to dream pop is chill wave, which can be even more atmospheric, more psyche, with lots of reverb, very mellow, and the use of vintage synthesizers for a certain type of retro sound that seems to be rooted, but not quite, in the 1980s. The word chill wave seems to come from a blog named Hipster Runoff, we think. Whatever the case, the intent was ironic. Calling something chill wave was not meant as a compliment, but then the internet took hold as it does and turned it into a thing. In fact, the summer of 2009 is still referred to as the summer of chill wave by some. Chill wave has synonyms. There's dream beat, glow fi, hypnagogic pop. Whatever the case, it was one of the first alt rock sub sub genres to bubble up almost exclusively from the internet. Today, chill wave lives on through artists like Ariel Pink, Neon Indian, and Washed Out. In fact, this may be the best known chill wave song to date. It's from Washed Out and is called Feel It All Around. A sample of Chill Wave from Washed Out, which is actually a guy named Ernie Green who lives in Athens, Georgia. This next genre is related to Dream Pop and Chill Wave, but is at the complete opposite end of the spectrum when it comes to texture. Lots of guitars, lots of synths, lots of sound processing effects, but the overall effect is much, much harder, machine-like, heavy, hard, aggressive in tone, attitude, and lyrics. And as soon as you hear it, you'll understand why this is called industrial music. Its roots go back to the 1970s to an intense experimental art rock band called Throbbing Gristle. They founded an indie label called Industrial Records, whose motto was industrial music for industrial people. The sound took off in Europe at first, before being imported into the United States in the early 80s, thanks to a Chicago label named Wax Tracks. It immediately caught on with the corner of the alternative crowd that was looking for something powerful, angry, extreme, and let's face it, brutal. As the 80s wore on, industrial music fragmented into many pieces. Electronic body music, power electronics, Japanese, which is some of the most extreme music ever invented. Related to that is power noise. There's industrial metal, martial industrial, which would drive John Philip Sousa insane. There's witch house, dark ambient, industrial hip hop, industrial techno, industrial metal, and industrial rock. Each are variations on that initial theme of heavy, hard, and aggressive music. The two best-selling industrial bands of all time are Ministry, which started out as a Depeche Mode-like synth band, and Nine Inch Nails, headed up by Trent Reznor. Trent has done more than any other person to bring industrial music to the masses. Nine Inch Nails with one more of the many shades of black known as industrial music. In a moment, three more alt-rock genres and the offshoots that have come with them. This is the second half of a program trying to make some order out of the hundreds and hundreds of subgenres that populate the alt-rock universe. There were so many types of music that we classify as alternative. And here's one that couldn't possibly fit anywhere else. It's called Psychobilly. This is one part punk, one part rockabilly, which itself is one of the earliest forms of rock and roll, a countrified sort that dates back to the 1950s, 
and one part schlocky sci-fi and horror movies. In fact, if you tip further in that particular direction, you'll get something called gothabilly. Ditch some of the country and old-time honky-tonk music elements, and you end up with horror punk. Most of these flavors also have themes of sex and violence in common, and more than a few ditch electric bass guitars for upright double basses. The king of all psychobilly bands was the Cramps. They emerged out of the stew of New York punk in the 1970s. But Psychobilly's real home has become Europe. It took hold in the UK first and then moved east. It's found lots of love in many of the former Soviet satellite states, East Germany, Poland, Bulgaria, that kind of thing. Canada has also contributed to the cause, the brains, the gutter demons, and the creep show. Most of what the creep show does is centered around horror movies. Here's a sample of what they do. This is from 2008 and it's called Run For Your Life. A taste of Canadian psychobilly, courtesy of The Creep Show. Related to this subgenre includes the previously mentioned gothabilly and horror punk, along with cowpunk, which is very countrified, and punk blues. This next type of alt rock came out of California in the early 1980s. It took Beatles like pop and mixed it with the light California psych that was popular in the 1960s. Fans took to calling this the Paisley Underground after a comment made by a member of a band called The Three O'Clock when referencing a red paisley dress found by a member in a thrift store. It came to describe like-minded groups who specialized in breezy pop songs with lots of melodies. And this label had the advantage of making it easier for record labels to discover these bands. And the biggest group to come out of the whole paisley underground was... The Bangles. Before they started having top 40 singles, They were a highly regarded garage pop band playing gigs with other Paisley Underground tag bands. And yes, the Bangles were once under the umbrella of Alternative, thanks to songs like this from 1984. Early music from the Bangles, a group once considered alternative thanks to their membership in a Southern California genre known as the Paisley Underground. One more, and this one is called Twee. This is a minor subsidiary division of a corner of the indie pop universe. It also has attributes of chamber pop, which tends to feature lots of strings and horn sections and piano. Twee is all about projecting innocence, sentimentality, vulnerability, and naivety, cut with some harmless playfulness. It's post-punk, but definitely not punk. It almost sounds like the thoughts of a bunch of 12-year-olds brought to life. The result is, at least to me, hugely infectious and fun. My favorite twee band is Glasgow's Bell and Sebastian, led by singer and songwriter Stuart Murdoch. Here's a track that just begs you to sing along, even though it's about a certain type of sexual device. An example of an alt-rock subgenre called Twee. It's Bell and Sebastian with the boy with the Arab strap from 1998. And that is just the briefest examination of all the subgenres that make up the universe of alt-rock. Now, we could have investigated, and I swear, I swear, these are real subgenres that have been canonized by people who do this sort of a thing for a living. We have progressive metalcore, deep gothic post-punk, hard chime, anthem worship, queer core. Brazilian surf rock, skinhead oi, Greek swing, baroque pop, swamp pop, anti-viral pop, indie anthem folk, sleaze rock. The list just goes on forever. You get the idea. If you have the time and inclination, I really recommend you Google or Bing a site called Every Noise at Once. You start clicking around and you may be lost for many, many, many hours, if not days. If I can help with anything, my email is alan at alancross.ca. My turnaround time for answering messages is pretty good. There's also my website, which is a journal of musical things.com. It's constantly being updated. And if you want to see how often it's being updated, there's a free daily newsletter that goes along with it. You should sign up. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Give me a follow if you can. And remember that free ongoing history podcasts are available through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Technical production is by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. 
You've been listening to the ongoing history of new music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Thank you.